Hi, this is a uh, feature video presentation in the series, What is the Magellan Course? And in this video presentation, we are going to look at the highest levels of ego development as described from uh, Suzanne Cook Reuter's work. Now, before we get into looking at these uh, levels as she describes it, I want to make a caveat, and that is from a linear perspective, development suggests that the new forms will come from the people or the individuals that have achieved the highest forms. But from an evolutionary perspective, that is rarely the case. From an evolutionary perspective, the highest or most mature forms of the current trajectory are usually dead ends in that the new forms branch out from earlier forms. So as we look at this video of the highest forms that have been described by developmental theory, the highest forms of cognitive and ego development, this is not to suggest that in the, the, the very individuals at the stage will be the individuals or the group of individuals that will carry on into the trajectory of the new form. And again, um, if we look at the evolutionary record, that's rarely the case. It's more often the case that the new trajectory toward the shift, the evolutionary shift to a higher structure or a novel structure comes from a branching of some prior forms. So with that caveat being said, um, I hope you enjoy this presentation of Suzanne cook um description of the higher levels of ego development as she can describe them. So the first highest level, the last two levels, which she calls post-autonomous stages, is called the construct aware stage. And she writes, at the construct aware stage, there is a new awareness of how language itself shapes one's reality. And for the first time, the boundaries, the lines or boundaries one has drawn can be seen for what they are, arbitrary but useful distinctions. Opposites can be embraced because one realizes they necessitate each other. So this brings into the notion of the identity of opposites. She states, the key to deeper understanding is to find the ground that encompasses and unifies them both. And this is very significant because the word ground is intentionally chosen, I think. Because instead of saying the key to understanding this relationship be between opposites is not to make the higher synthetic move, but to find the deeper ground that encompasses and has unified them both. Then at the next stage, at the unitive stage, one knows that opposites represent one underlying reality. So there's no longer a search, it's just a, a knowing that. The struggle of opposites is a symptom of our illusion that the boundaries we hold are real. Thus, the solution to the struggle lies in the dissolving of all boundaries. Even the boundary between our map-creating minds and our experience of reality. And so there's this transparency that the maps that we make to represent reality have these boundaries. And also create a boundary between the map-making activity and our experience of reality. For the unitive person, immediate experience with the universe represents a freedom 
from the tensions created by objectifying reality and framing it in dualistic terms. So this is a very profound statement that there can be for the unitive person an ex immediate experience with the universe that is free of the framing in objectified or reified or abstract or conceptual terms free of the framing of that in dualistic terms. And so for the unitive person, the unitive person understands that because they can see or intuit or be aware of a reality that is non-dualistic, they can see that the dualistic aspect of reality is constructed by the mind that frames that reality or represents that reality in dualistic terms. So if we look at the movement or the operations from conventional to post-conventional to post-autonomous or the highest stages, this is what Suzanne Krutgorita has to say. In conventional development, conventional development is the is constituted by the frame of mind that is most attached to rationality or this rational structure of consciousness and tends to defend most against the intrusion of material from either non-rational whether it's mythical or pre-conventional sources or from more integrated later perspectives so the conventional mind the conventional or standard mindset set of the rational structure, what gaps are called the mental structure, is defends itself against the suggestion that there are there are other ways of knowing, whether they're they're pre-conventional, so mythical uh, sources of influx, or whether they're post-conventional. If the conventional mind accepts the transpersonal personal at all, it often does so as a belief system or an ideology and it adheres to its letter and mechanics rather than its spirit. So the conventional mind can accept, in quotations, the concept of transpersonal and how it works, how it can engineer problem solving as received knowledge because that's the conventional mind can operate abstractions in a system systematic sort of way without actually experiencing the transpersonal realm. In the post-conventional situation, we see that the post-conventional mind reverses the process of separation and differentiation of the e earlier ego, ego stages. And this is very important because up to, up to the post-conventional stage, all the moves the ego has made is this pattern of differentiation, separation, differentiation, more and more complex, integration to a higher level, new separation, differentiation, more and more complex, integration at higher levels. So this is the progressive stage up the developmental ladder. But once you get to the post-conventional development, this whole process, this whole dynamic of ego, ego making meaning reverses that process. The rigid boundaries between knower and known are gradually deconstructed and merged. The dismantling occurs in two steps. One, the dialectic or systemic view, and two, the unitary stage or post-autonomous view. To see reality as well as the self as an interconnected whole or system rather than as an aggregate of separate well-defined elements is the first step towards a more holistic view of reality. So in the dialectic stage or systemic view, 
We have systems thinkers are aware of themselves as participant observers who are inevitably part of the problem space. So this is a new development, very high stage development. They see that complex problems cannot be solved by refining existing linear scientific methods. So they look toward metasystemic or paradigmatic change. However, they still believe in a rationally knowable reality and rely on logically derived solutions and procedures and they do not yet understand how profoundly humans are conditioned by the language habit. So this is the stage at which people start to reason and problem solve systemically and then metasystemically and then paradigmatically and then cross paradigmatically because they keep working the system. They keep working the system that relies on logically derived solutions and procedures and so they hyper complexify the problem because they cannot get underneath they cannot get underneath the conditions of thought itself so here's a little sidebar when we look at the actual models of cognitive development we see they are limited by the cognitive capacities of the theorist and the researcher and the philosopher themselves. So from Piaget who was a simple linear structuralist through Basetius who sees development as dialectical to even the great metasystemic and cross paradigmatic thinkers like Commons and Fishers to the post autonomous view of Cook Reuter we see that they include more and more and more of the developmental territory at the higher levels depending upon the level that their models are operating on. The higher stages in the systems view remain wedded to symbolic codification. Purely cognitive models do not realize the incommensurability between symbol and that which is symbolized. The models do not recognize the limit, limits of rational analysis and of symbolic representation and thus cannot discover the hidden assumptions and paradoxes that they enact in their own models. So the, here is a short couple of videos of Suzanne Cook Reuter um, talking about this move into a post-autonomous stage. Whatever I've relied on so far, suddenly it's somewhat suspicious. And then to come to an integration and say, that's fine. That's one of the many ways of how I can be. And so when you're doing that, you're actually operating from a space where you can see your own perspectives. Yes. And where you can enter the ego and say, okay, I'm playing this game or that game, or, or I'm witnessing to the games I'm playing, and also the genuine efforts and the struggles and all of that. And that's a, all a bit of distance. That's a thrilling discovery, isn't it? The first time, yes. So, you know, <laughs> the threat, and also a, a disturbing one. Yeah. Because what now what can you stand on? In the postmodernism, you start questioning some of the cultural assumptions, but not yet the fundamental. You still believe that with language and enough methods and all that, you will figure out what's going on. And you're saying in postmodern. Yes, yes, but just more complex yes. than we thought. But now you say, there's nothing I can do. There's really nothing to hold on. So now what? And then when you watch, automatically can't be helped as the evolutionary spirit, you great? have transcendent moments. And then you say, ah, oh, there's something else. Right. Something totally else. A new, if you want a theoretical, a new paradigm. 
Before it was differentiation, integration, and sort of in a very regular pattern, more and more complex, higher and higher levels of perspectives, and now it's something totally different. And In the post-autonomous stages, we have the construct aware person who begins to reject the overall stance of the systems thinker, who becomes aware of the profound splits inherent in rational thought, who becomes conscious of the linguistic process of splitting into dualistic opposites, and consciously experiences the ego's machinations and self-preservation processes. So there's a turning in of awareness of how this whole thing works. You've been on this path of reconciling opposites only to exchange them for other opposites. The dualistic mind keeps dancing and dancing and dancing. This whole pattern of movement toward higher levels becomes completely transparent to the construct aware person through turning into and observing their own mental processes the construct aware person can spontaneously discover a direct mode of experiencing where knower and known momentarily merge and the personal self-sense disappears. And she becomes conscious of the difference between symbol and the underlying phenomenon it symbolizes. And so the use of language becomes very specific with the construct-aware person. So the construct-aware person becomes aware and works toward accepting language, that language has work to do, that language is pointing out underlying phenomena and ensure other people you could always point out the antithesis or the antithetical or the dialectical aspect of the statement. But the construct aware person is trying to work hard to show you that language is doing something. It's pointing to the underlying phenomenon and you can play with it in a dialectical or polarity or dualistic framework. But the construct aware person works toward designing language that is less susceptible to toying with it that way so that it is more successful in doing the work of pointing to the underlying phenomenon. And at this point, the what Suzanne Kukorda has found is that the construct aware person, first of all, they're relatively isolated. There's not a lot of people that they can interact with at this at this level. And there are problem, existential problems that arise um, with this level of awareness. And there's usually two responses to it, according to her research. There's two responses to the predicament of realizing the futility of creating objective artifacts from a need to make permanent and substantive that which is in flux and immaterial. And so the two responses she's categorized into the more rationally inclined construct aware person remains indebted to and tries to perfect conscious discursive rationality. Whereas the more intuition directed person is drawn to move beneath or beyond discursive rationality at all. 
the more rationally inclined person then valiantly constructs an ever more precise account in real time of their complex and dynamic theories about how the world and their minds work only to deconstruct them as soon as they become aware of doing so. Whereas the more intuition-directed persons yearn deeply to make the transpersonal experience permanent, wanting to be free of the judging mind and the endlessly categorizing and labeling experience, wishing to simplify, to wishing to simply witness life as it inf unfolds. In contradistinction to these two responses, if they reach the unitive stage, people learn to accept reality as is, showing a tolerance of continuous change, can embrace polar opposites on an effective level and not just cognitively, and are open to ongoing experience and have deeper empathy for all beings. People at the unitive stage are more at ease with a fluid, open-ended self-identity with not knowing who they are.